me change some menus. Can everyone see everything okay? Looks beautiful. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so hello, I'm Caitlin Spadavecchio. Thank you so much um, and good afternoon. Today, I'm gonna be talking about my project with Dr. Prokobolos on introducing geometric algebra to introductory physics. So the relationship between math and physics has been studied by mathematicians, physicists, and philosophers since antiquity. Galileo was one of the first to argue that math and physics are truly connected. He said, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Their relationship is still believed to be greatly connected. While some believe mathematics to be an important tool for physicists, other believe their connection goes much deeper. Einstein writes in his book, Ideas and Opinions, I am convinced that purely mathematical construction enables us to find those concepts and those law-like connections between them that provide the key to understanding natural phenomena. The key to understanding natural phenomenon is in its mathematical construction. Most physicists and physics educators take mathematics for granted and fail to realize that the use of mathematics can be designed to hold a better treatment of the natural world. Isaac Newton is, is an example of this with his invention of calculus that is essential for the work in classical mechanics. On the left is his publication. Note I say invent here instead of discover because Einstein himself said that scientific theories cannot be extracted from experience but must be freely invented. Einstein is another example of this with his collaboration to create differential geometry for his theory of general relativity. He needed a new kind of math to make the jump from Newtonian space to curved space. While mathematics serves as a tool for extending our knowledge, it also serves to limit us as well. David Hestinez, who is best known for his work in geometric algebra and science education, says limitations of mathematics mathematics are evident in the fact that the analytic geometry that provides the foundation for classical me mechanics is insufficient for general relativity. This limitation should alert us to the possibility of other conceptual limits in mathematics used by physicists. So to go further in physics, we probably need new math, like Einstein and Newton both recognized. One problem, however, with the new math that's being created, it doesn't really build off of existing math, so they sort of live independently and they make things quite complicated. With all of our existing mathematical representations, physicists and students may face many challenges. The biggest one is understanding which type of math to use for a specific instance in physics. Some of the most important types of math for a physicist include vector calculus, differential equations, linear algebra, and statistics. And this is just a small fraction of what a physicist should be familiar with. This image shows the type of math used for just some of the types of physics that exist. Physicists and students have to overcome many challenges set by our various mathematical models, including fragmentation of knowledge and language barriers. Proficiency in all types of math is another challenge. It is much more common for physicists to specialize in only a handful of the systems, which limits the type of work they can do. In this image on the right, the blue boxes are some of the different branches of physics, and the orange boxes are some of the type of math that are those branches use. So you can see there's a lot of the same math used for multiple branches, like linear algebra, trigonometry, and calculus, for example. This overlapping knowledge between the system hints that there might be a better way to connect similar ideas within our structures. And that's, what, and that's exactly what William Clifford discovered. Through our 10 weeks, we have been researching Clifford's geometric algebra that he created in the 19th century that provides a unified framework for all these different types of math. So if, ge if geometric algebra is so great, why haven't a lot of people heard about it? Well, that's because there's another problem in the way new information is assimilated in the scientific community. Vector algebra sort of won the battle against geometric algebra because of the considerable reputation of the physicist who brought it forward. William Gibbs advertised his vectors for the use in physics, which is really what gave him the step up over Clifford's geometric algebra. Geometric algebra, however, takes all of these boxes that you see in this image and replaces them with one set of rules with the same notation, and that is geometric algebra. This is like taking all the tools you can find in a toolbox and creating one tool with them. 
sort of like the Swiss Army knife, but a lot more in inclusive. So what is GA exactly? Its best description is a graded associative algebra, but I'll make that more clear. GA includes different geometric elements. Grade zero elements are the scalars, which is a set of all real numbers. Grade one elements are vectors, or you can think of them as lengths. Grade two elements are bivectors, which can be thought of as areas. And grade three element is the trivector, which can be thought of as a volume. I go into much more detail about this in my video, but um, what's important to understand here is that all of these different geometric objects can be added and multiplied together and are not limited to being the same geometric object, which is something we are limited to in basic algebra. So our goal for the 10 weeks was to start off a video series introducing geometric algebra and its extension projective geometric algebra to introductory physics. Our end goal is to highlight the benefits of using GEA and PGA and show alternative ways of doing and thinking about common problems in physics and specifically in classical mechanics. Not only does geometric algebra help to unify different areas of math, it also simplifies some parts of math as well. One example is in geometric algebra, forces and torques become the same geometric object. And it turns out a lot of conceptual clarity is brought to this topic because it's actually clear what torque is, while it's still kind of unclear the way um, physics is taught to an introductory physics student. Much simplification is also brought to the topics of Euler angles and spin operators in quantum mechanics as well. To further motivate our project, I'll play some of the background that I go over in my first video. So I find that it works better um, on my actual desktop. So I'm gonna share that. Geometric algebra focuses on connecting the ideas of linear algebra with geometric interpretations. It describes vectors, planes, and volumes in a single algebra. One of its most powerful applications is in rotations and other geometric transformations like reflections and translations. The dot and cross product were defined in Hamilton's quaternion algebra. There is one limitation, however, and that is that the cross product only works in three dimensions. Later, mathematician Hermann Grassmann introduced the interior product and the exterior product, which is similar to the cross product, but that it works in any number of dimensions. The geometric product of vectors includes the interior and exterior product and returns both a scalar and bivector at the same time. Um, so the video also covers the elements, properties, and products that are important to the algebra, and some examples are included. Um, while I don't have a much time here to address algebra, my video will be made available for those who are interested. Um, and for our future work, we plan on continuing the video series, with the next video being an introduction on projective geometric algebra, but these bullet points are just some of the future videos. Really helpful for me in my research and um, for the acknowledgments, I'd really like to thank the Bear School of Natural and Environmental Sciences for funding this research. Thank you so much.